The practice of annotation, or how reading with a pen in hand can change your life. This video will introduce you to the skill of annotating, which is useful for all of the reading that you might find yourself doing, and is also a skill that many of your teachers will expect you to utilize in your English classes. To annotate has a dictionary definition, which reads, to supply with critical or explanatory notes, or to comment upon in notes, and also to make annotations or notes. More practically speaking, to annotate means reading with a pen in your hand and looking to mark the text so as to make it entirely your own. Why would you want to make a text your own? Well, that's precisely the writer's intention in writing. He wants to communicate with you and make an impact. But the truth is, we're extremely intimidated by the printed word. Whenever we open a book, we feel like that it looked that way from the beginning of time, as if it dropped fully formed out of the sky. But all writing is composed, and all writing invites us to take it apart and understand how it works. Even our greatest writers, like James Joyce, deserve to be challenged. And annotating is a way of communicating back with them and creating a dialogue that allows for a deeper understanding of the story. In fact, the people who know writing best, other writers, use annotations all the time. Whether to learn more about their craft or get deeper into a story. Possible strategies include making notes in the margins, offering diagrams or edits, offering a penetrating insight that reveals a deeper truth, or just offering a snarky commentary or takedown. There are three principal reasons to annotate. The first is to read actively. That's actively as opposed to passively, skimming, letting a text just sort of wash over your brain. To read actively means to always be on the lookout for moments of significance, for things that are unusual. To read with an alert mind, it brings out the most vivid qualities of a work and forces you to take it further. The second reason to annotate is to discuss precisely. When you go into class after reading a story, if you want to refer to a particular passage so that people will know what you're talking about, you can point it out by having annotated and bringing it to everybody's attention. This way you can move directly to the passage and have evidence for the thing you want to say and allow people to move further into the text. Also, whenever your teacher asks for a particular place in the story where, say, an important characterization or description takes place, if you've been paying attention as you read, you can go directly to that point in the story and show it to everyone. The last reason to annotate when it comes to the activities of English class is so that when it comes time to writing your critical essays, you will be able to write in an authoritative manner. That is, with a great and supreme knowledge of how the story works, and so that you can use evidence in your essays that is exact and direct and is perfectly cited. In a way, annotating now makes writing essays later much more manageable and likely to succeed. Now, let's illustrate the two main components of annotating by looking at the exceedingly memorable opening of Edgar Allan Poe's Cask of Amontillado. The first component of annotation is simply to identify a piece of text, to set one part of the text apart from everything else. You can do this in so many different ways that are suited to however style you'd like to use. You could underline. You can put something in a box. You can bracket. Or you can even circle particular words. Whatever works for you, whatever says this is more important than all the rest of the words on this page. You can also very readily use little symbols like a star or a check which says this part's important. I want to remember to come back here. 
it doesn't have to take much effort or time at all. The second component of annotation, after you've identified something significant or important in the text, is to add your own words, to offer a comment in the margin, even if it's only a brief note, to illuminate why it is that you picked that part out. For example, reading Poe's story for the first time, we might be profoundly struck by the opening sentence, and yet have no idea why. The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best I could, but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. It's extremely memorable. It leaps off the page. But if we think about it a bit more, it gives us a lot of information that's going to be crucial to understanding the rest of the story. For one thing, we have a sense of who the narrator is. He uses the first person and announces, moreover, that it's his intention to get revenge on this Fortunato guy. So already we see that we know who the narrator is who's telling the story, and we have a sense of his character, of what he intends to do. Moving down the page, we encounter another crucial element of annotation, and that's simply defining words we don't know. When you get to the point in the paragraph when the narrator says, I must not only punish, but punish with impunity, and you don't know what the word impunity means, you'll have no idea what's going on in that sentence. It's important to identify a word you don't know, to pause, to look it up, and to figure out what it means so that the full sense of the text will be plain to you. Ah, that's better. As you can see, annotating takes a little bit longer than the reading you might be used to, but it's absolutely crucial for the full comprehension of the text, and indeed, the full enjoyment. Now you try a little annotation of your own, whether on your hard copy of the story text or on the screen here if you have a tablet device. Take a minute and with a pen in your hand, identify what seems important and memorable to you. Perhaps a, there's a word in there that you don't understand? Or simply a section that you want to mark with a star and say, I better come back to this. Let's look again at that opening sentence. We know it's memorable. And we know also that it's the narrator declaring a bit of his intention and revealing his character. The most obvious thing, it seems, is that he's out for revenge. But what other aspects of his personality would you say come through in that opening sentence? It seems like the emphasis on insult from Fortunato reveals a certain pridefulness in our narrator. It's almost as if he's put up with a lot of the other stuff that Fortunato does, but once he touches his personality, then it's time to strike him down. It's after multiple readings of the story that we start to wonder why it is that the narrator hardly mentions his own name. It's almost as if the vengeance is driving his personality, and we see that very clearly from the start. These are thoughts that come to you when you read very closely, and perhaps even repeatedly, and paying attention to the elements of the story. Other words that might be unfamiliar, unredressed, retribution, redresser. These words take on a significance for our narrator Montresor, as it almost seems like he announces the rules for the revenge that he's going to take. This section is so important that you might even want to just bracket it off and put a star there to say, I'd like to figure out what this means because I think it has a big bearing on the rest of the story. Here's another passage from The Cask of Amontillado. 
This time, in reading it over, use your annotation to try to determine significant elements of the setting of the story and other details that might be revealing. The fact that the encounter between Montresor and Fortunato takes place at dusk and, as Montresor says, during the supreme madness of carnival season, tells us a lot about the atmosphere of their encounter. Dusk is near nightfall, a time of darkness, and the supreme madness of the carnival season? Well, that doesn't sound like a very inviting time. Supreme madness and dusk com combined create an atmosphere of real danger and a threatening feeling. Moreover, the fact that it's set at carnival suggests a kind of deceptiveness. Carnival is a time when everyone gets up in disguises. Might disguise have something to do with Montresor and his act of revenge? Furthermore, when we see Montresor talking about Fortunato, he describes him as wearing motley. This might seem like an insignificant detail, but if you read on, you can see that the motley outfit consists of party-striped dress, conical cap and bells. It's almost like this is the costume of a clown or a fool. This is certainly how Montresor views Fortunato at this point and gives an indication, a foreshadowing, of the kind of fate that he's going to meet. Finally, if we look at the last line in the paragraph, where Montresor says he was so pleased to see Fortunato that he thought he should never have done wringing his hand, we get an interesting sense of our narrator through the detail. He says that he's so pleased when, of course, we know from the outset of the story that all he wants to do is get revenge on this guy. So the sort of pleasure he's talking about here is probably a more perverse one. Moreover, when we see, I should never have done wringing his hand, wringing his hand is a very violent act. And if we've read the story once through, we know that wringing his hand here has a much more sinister connotation. So let's sum up a few of the things you can look for as you actively read and annotate your texts. The first is the story's themes, or its primary concepts and ideas. Some of the key themes of the Cask of Amontillado would include revenge, deception, madness. As we see, the setting of a story goes a long way in corroborating its themes, creating an atmosphere, and doing a lot of important work that isn't necessarily immediately perceptible. Paying attention to the setting helps reveal the central features of a story. Who are the principal characters in this story? When's the first time they appear? When do they do their most significant act? In paying attention to the characters, when they talk and what they do, you do the work of characterization that's really essential. Annotation can help you focus on the plot. When's the climax of the story? What's the most important thing that takes place? It can be useful just to put a big star next to what you think is, is important. Figurative language, or language that is unusual, or lyrical, or calls attention to itself in some way, is always worth your attention. If it seems out of place, or it seems somehow like it's calling attention to something, then it's going to be important. Finally, in the study of poetry, annotation is extremely helpful and arguably necessary in determining the features of a poem in its rhythm and its sound that will help you unlock its deeper meanings and delights. And of course, perhaps the most important reason to annotate at all is to identify parts of a reading that you have questions about. You're not sure what's going on. You're confused and you want to ask about it in class. 
The second, of course, is anything that you like in the story. It might sound obvious, but it might be the thing that you come back to most of all, a line you found, found memorable or meaningful or beautiful in some way. Last but certainly not least is that a key to annotation is not to do too much. Highlighting the entire body of a text is no better than highlighting none of it at all. Less is more here, absolutely. Maybe one or two key lines per paragraph, a key word, whatever is actually important. Remember that annotation is a means to an end, and that means you do it so that it enhances your reading. If ever it gets in the way of your enjoying a story or takes too long for you to make the act of reading practical, change your habits. One thing that I can say is that while it may take longer to read with your pen in your hand at first, if you practice, it'll make you an amazing, close and efficient reader, even faster than you were before. So, some final parting thoughts. Keep practicing. You'll get more efficient and better at, an at annotating as you go. However you annotate, one thing that your teachers are going to be looking from you is that you develop a kind of a system and you stay consistent. Everybody's going to do this their own way, but if you can find a way that works for you and keep using it, you will really have mastered and made this skill useful to you. And perhaps the last word is, you never know when you're going to come across great writing. You might want to have a pen handy to jot some notes down, some original ideas, and maybe the beginning of some writing of your own.